Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode eight of Stir Crazy. It is our latest ever evolving offering from us here at The Real News Network. I'm your host, Kim Brown. We've got a big show in store for you today, including a range of topics as I'm, I'm sure you will want to weigh in on. So if you see something, hear something that you like or you don't like, be sure to hit us up in the comments section, all right? So here's what is on deck. We're gonna be joined a little bit later in the show with journalist and author Baynard Woods. Baynard is going to tell us how he survived the Rona, baby, and he's going to come with you, uh, come to us, rather, with tips and suggestions on how to deal with and survive uh, self-quarantine, self-isolation, all the things that come along with the new normal that we now live in. Also, if you've been masturbating to Andrew Cuomo, you need to stop. He is not exactly who you think he is. Plus, we're going to talk about why Amazon is attacking its own workers and Republicans in Wisconsin. They literally want voters to die while casting their vote in today's primary. Joe Biden and the Supreme Court are like, eh, sounds about right. Uh, but first, Let's introduce and bring in our panel. Today, we are joined with Leandro Laguerra. He is part of Baltimore's Chinatown Collective. He is also senior staff with us here at The Real News. Starting at Power Forward, Lisa Snowden McCray, coming in at five foot five. She's ready to bang on y'all from the news perspective. And joining us today from New York City, we have Jesse A. Meyerson. He's a writer and uh, organizer joining us today. So hello, gang. Thank you all for being here. Hello. Hey. I well, wish I was 5'5". Really? I'm a 5'2". <laughs> I was going to say. I, 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 feel, I feel the short lady's pain. Trust me, trust me. But, um, but on, a, on a serious tip, guys, I, I want us to go around real quick and just talk about, you know, how we're all dealing with being self-isolated, self-social distancing here in Maryland. I know myself, Lisa, and Leandro, um, we just got the news today from Governor Larry Hogan that the D.C., Washington, and Baltimore corridor are, are probably going to be the next hot spot. So, Lisa, how, how are you dealing with this? Um, I mean, I think it goes day by day, case by case. Um, as you guys know, I was out sick last week, and that was terrifying. I actually called up Baynard, who we'll be talking to later, because I was like, am I going to die? Do I have coronavirus? Is this just a normal illness? So that was scary. Um, but I think I'm on the mend now. I did earlier today do my first Target run in full mask, glove, gear. So that's just a weird thing. And seeing kind of the ever-evolving process of kind of trying to keep people safe at, my, at the Target down the street from my house, seeing how we've changed from like, business as normal to, you know, a little bit more cleaning to now they're making people stand in line like six feet apart and aggressively wiping everything down. It's just kind of weird seeing something that's so normal, like the target that I run to every day, just kind of change in the face of this big, massive, scary thing. Leandro, how are things looking from your corner of the world? I mean, I, I think it's been pretty good. I, I think from the beginning, I kind of assumed we were a hot spot, so acted accordingly. Uh, I know that you know cases of Corona haven't ramped up as much here as as in say like New York City, but I think to be on the safe side, you kind of have to pretend that you know everyone's infected at this point. So um, I don't think anything's going to change my behavior. I have kind of succumbed to some trends, and I've started baking bread, pound cake. I'm in dire need of a haircut, but you know every time I go out, it 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 feels kind of terrifying this point and and you still see so many people who are disregarding kind of social distancing norms or rules and such and it and it's just terrifying especially in baltimore the dc fish market this past weekend um if you saw those sites uh baltimore there's a bar literally giving out drinks for free so people were hanging out outside and they were all clumped together so i mean there are still people who don't believe this is happening Incredible. And Jesse, you're coming to us from the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, New York City, which experienced its greatest single day death toll on Monday with over 700 dead. What's your take? How, how are you doing? Um, 
Well, it's very difficult here. I mean, there's been sirens nonstop for at least the last week, uh, all day and all night, which is a very eerie experience. <clears throat> uh, similarly, I, I went out recently in full uh, mask and gloves, um, and it was very eerie walking down the street and seeing uh, almost everybody in gloves. Um, uh, the the yeah, it's and we're bracing for more. I mean, I know that this was the the highest death toll in New York so far, but. Um, everything that I've read about what has gone on in Italy and China um, and knowing how much worse our governmental response has been uh, than those places uh, makes me think that probably in the coming week to weeks to month to months, uh, we're going to see a, an awful lot more death. Um, I've already had several friends who have had it uh, or think they've had it because obviously you can't get tested unless you're hospitalized, um, but uh, mostly they've they've all cleared up. Um, but who knows? I think a lot of grief is about to come down the pike uh, in New York City. Yeah, I'll share something with you guys real quick. Um, my neighbors are Chinese and they're Chinese immigrants, so they don't really speak English all that great. Their mother-in-law just came in today from China. And it was interesting watching them take her things out of the car and then like her on the porch. So her son had on gloves. He was wiping down all of her luggage. He was using hand sanitizer. When she got on the porch, they sprayed her down. I mean, it was pretty remarkable. And I had a conversation with the lady yesterday and I said, you know, you, you, you were coming from China, a country that is handling this smartly to a country that is handling this now stupidly. So I kind of feel bad for her timing, uh, deciding to travel to the US right now. But as we're talking about coronavirus, obviously it's quite serious and it's more serious for some groups more so than others. We know how it is impacting the elderly, but we're seeing some stark numbers coming out regarding how coronavirus the COVID-19 pandemic is killing African-Americans at an alarming rate. Uh, the good folks over at Demos um, put out a, a very detailed memo about the causes for this um, disproportionate killing, basically, of black folks here in the U.S. Uh, Leandro, I know you took a look at it. Can you bring us up to speed? Yeah, I mean, I think the piece talks about kind of um, institutional racism throughout the years, especially when it comes to the healthcare system. Um, it especially talks about that, you know, there's a history of kind of uh, poor health care among black and brown communities. So they've kind of built up uh, underlying conditions. I think uh, the most interesting thing, additionally, on top of having poor health and, and potentially poor diets and, and to be susceptible to coronavirus is that they also have jobs that, you know, you don't have the luxury of working from home. So they're, they're going to be front facing, they're going to be people facing. So not only are they more susceptible, but they're also, you know, more at risk in terms of, of contracting the virus because they're constantly exposed to people uh, and they don't have a choice. You know, they don't have a choice to not work. Um, otherwise, you know, they could make those choices in, the, in that kind of luxury and kind of social distance away from each other, but they just can't, especially in places like Louisiana or Michigan or Chicago and those places. So. You know, as you said, Leandro, New Orleans is experiencing 70% um, of its coronavirus-related deaths are African-American. That is the same number in Chicago. Uh, you know, Lisa, has, when I read these numbers, I was reading these statistics and literally my blood ran cold. When you think about how many people I, I know personally who have underlying conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, heart disease, things that make people more susceptible to catching this virus and, and suffering possibly, you know, life ending consequences. Why is this being born on black people so much? And why do you also think in some places like Maryland, why is there a reluctance to release this data uh, along racial lines? So, so this country has never ever, was never designed to keep a safe or healthy and um, I saw, I think it was a Washington Post columnist who tweeted out that her dad, who's a doctor, was saying, you know, we're really about to see uh, medical racism. And the thing that I thought about was that we've already seen that. We've seen that with um, the stories that have been coming with more and more frequency about women dying, black women dying in childbirth, um, about black women and black people wanting to be treated for pain and being told, you know, we're just exaggerating, not being treated adequately. 
So this is really just like the next step. Whenever, like, like the guy that was on yesterday, I think it was Marcus Farrell said, uh, when white America gets a cold, black people get the flu. And this is just another reminder of that. I think that if there's anybody among us who still thinks that this country is a good place for black people on like uh, April, whatever this is, 2020, then I don't know what planet they're living on because it's not safe for us. Jesse, so many pictures are coming out of Queens. I think the hospital is, is it Elmhurst Hospital? Mm -hmm. um, from your observation, are black and brown communities bearing this worse than more affluent white areas in New York City? Yeah, no doubt about it. You can look at the map and see that. I, uh, as a side note, I used to be a, a, a labor organizer organizing the nurses at Elmhurst Hospital. So I've seen um, up close, the you know, it's a public hospital. It's a safety net hospital. It treats um, Queens as the, the, I think, the most diverse um, area in the country, um, immigrants from all over the country or from all over the world. Um, and I think that this is a good uh, opportunity to bring in a concept that um, rarely gets discussed when we talk about healthcare, because when we talk about healthcare, we mainly talk about healthcare services, how we're going to treat people who are ill or injured. And maybe you like the Affordable Care Act or you want a public option or you want Medicare for all, which um, I emphatically do. Um, but what we need to think about um, with this is a, a phrase that's called the social determinants of health. Um, and that's the idea that if you live in a food desert, or as Dr. Kamara Phyllis-Jones might say, um, a fast food swamp, or if you are subject to routine toxic stress because you have to walk down the street wondering if a cop is going to kill you or a loved one, or if you are um, unhoused or housing insecure or any of these other things, um, those all lead to bad health care outcomes. So we can't just deal with, even if we had Medicare for all, even if we socialized and gave everybody a guaranteed human right to health care services, if we still had a society that was making people sick, we would just be... Um, like trimming branches off of a poison tree that we were still watering. So in other words, if we want to really um, enhance, pe and, and as a result, um, we should also note that like racism is a social determinant of health. Uh, the more racist a society is, the more stratification there is along racial lines, um, then the likelier you are as a member of an oppressed racial group to suffer bad health outcomes. Um, and, you know, Dr. King called uh, inequality in, in, um, in healthcare the most outrageous uh, inequality there was, and, and it's quite clear that actually all of it is healthcare. Housing is healthcare, food is healthcare, education is healthcare, um, police and prisons and border enforcement are healthcare. And so we really need to revolutionize society in general and not just focus on the healthcare treatment that people get um, in order to uh, change that dynamic. Um, the, the phrase that Kamara Phyllis Jones uses is that you can learn more about a person's health outcomes from their zip code than from their genetic code. Hey guys, you know, I wanted to throw this out there kind of quick because we're seeing governors and mayors especially get more serious about social distancing and mandating that people social distance. Leandro mentioned the wharf in Washington, D.C. The fish market was packed full of people over the weekend. I know that fish market very well. You can go down there and get crabs, shrimps, anything you need. So on the weekends, it is a crowded place. But now, uh, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, Governor Andrew Cuomo, I think Larry Hogan now in Maryland, and others have said they're going to start fining people, um, not insignificant amounts of money, if you were caught not properly social distancing or or gathering in, in some way. I mean, Jesse, I, I think the fine in New York City is $1,000. I mean, I don't see how this is helpful at all, because what for, for one, if you're out of work, you don't have $1,000. Second of all, in New York City, it's it's a you know popula population dense area, so you might be social distancing from the people you live with in your own house if you go outside, and the fact that people could possibly be locked up while there's a pandemic spreading behind bars. I mean, the, these mayors and, and governors. I mean, is is this an effective thing to do? Is this a, a rational thing to do, Jesse? No, I mean, and I think we see like um, Rikers Island had its first. Uh, COVID death recently, um, and it was somebody who was locked up on a technicality, I think a parole violation. Um, and so when we see that, um, it should be clear 
that uh, punishment, which is our society's preferred way of dealing with any problem that we can find, be it with fines or fees or with um, locking people up or with uh, deporting them back to their country of origin, that these things are really cruel and actually they um, they uh, destroy our, our whole society. If everybody in Rikers is getting coronavirus, that puts everybody else who's not in Rikers at risk. And so we have to figure out ways of getting people the support that they need in order to be that like a hotel room so that they can isolate on their own if they live in a situation where they can't isolate um, in their house or in a, a group home or a juvenile detention facility or a jail or any of those other um, settings where you're housed really closely with people, whatever it is, we need to get people the services that they need in order to be able to take care of themselves and not punish them for failing to live up to the, um, the government standards for how they should be going about their lives. Leandro, hop in there for a second. Oh, I'm sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Sure. All right. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I always think about, you know how like, was it that Chris Brown joke when he said that when you got hurt, your dad just told you to put some testing on it. Like, I feel like everyone wants to just put some police on everything. Like, that'll fix Girl. everything. <laughs> and like, that's not gonna happen. Like, it's, it's and if, again, if we go back to everything being kind of intersectional and everything being tied to race, who are the people that are gonna be targeted most? The, the thing that the internet in Baltimore that Leandra was talking about was a white establishment. And I believe, Leandro, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the pictures that were seen was actually a police officer hanging out with some of these white people that are just outside hanging out. And, you know, we can go back to Baltimore, Freddie Gray, the uprising, and the police were getting black people off the street and hanging out with white people. So, that. so um, you're absolutely right, Lisa. Just a quick correction on that. That establishment was actually closed. And those people were actually lived uh, like above it and they were just hanging out in front of that storefront. Uh, but they were hanging out with a police officer. There's a bunch of uh, older white men hanging out with a police officer just smoking cigars who didn't believe uh, it happened. But I think, you know, I agree with Jesse that, you know, finding individuals is probably not where we should go. But uh, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of restaurants and restaurateurs who are trying their best to kind of still earn a living and following all the rules given to them. And they're, there are essentially a lot of bad actors who either don't believe this or essentially are flouting the rules. And I think you can do something about that. I mean, there should be a zero tolerance policy if you are encouraging gatherings of, you know, that doesn't encourage social distancing. If you're doing things like while your customers wait, you're giving away free alcohol. So you're kind of making an impromptu bar. There, there was a, um, a place in Baltimore that was doing exactly that. And, they end up having a line, you know, around the block and people were just lingering because they were getting free beer and free booze and stuff like that. So even like the, the D.C. Wharf, I don't know like how you could have prevented that because the weather was so nice and people do need food. But, you know, we have to have a kind of a zero tolerance policy on establishments that encourage big gatherings because, you know, it, it's it's terrifying to see those kind of crowds. Absolutely. And people do need food. And I hope that maybe this will prompt uh, people. I, I know our audience is all over the place across the, the nation and across the globe. But if you're from Maryland and you're of a certain age, you remember when the crab man would be pulled over on the side of the road and you could just pull up behind him on the shoulder and get yourself a couple of dozen or even a bushel of crabs if it happened to be payday that week. But um, you guys, I want us to bring in Baynard Woods because Baynard, well, a lot of you probably know Baynard here from The Real News, but he's also a journalist, author. He, he opines from time to time. Uh, Baynard had the Rona. Baynard survived the Rona. And Baynard has a piece in The Washington Post talking about how he dealt with his ordeal. And he joins us right now from Baltimore. Baynard, thanks for being here. Hey, y'all. Good to be here. Hey, Baynard. So, Baynard. Hey, Baynard. <laughs> uh, so the first question I have for you, Baynard, is how did you get the Rona? I think most people want to know how people are contracting this because it's such a, a, a myriad of ways to become infected. So how did you become infected with COVID-19? I mean, to be clear, because of the lack of testing, I have no idea if I was actually infected with it. My doctors told me that it sounded like it and to act as if um, I was infected, but I don't really have any idea if I was or not, um, because Maryland at that point at least was the worst in the entire country at giving tests. Um, 
And, uh, and for that reason, the, the first thing they asked me when I called was, had I traveled? And they still weren't looking at community infection at that point. And I was clearly infected somewhere here within this community. I had not uh, traveled to any of the other hotspots or whatever. And so um, I have no idea where I got sick. But um, Sunday, almost a month ago now, a month this Sunday, I started feeling bad was was kind of had done youtube yoga for the first time that day was it's a little bit sore like what's going on uh thought it was nothing and then that night had 102 fever and for the next three weeks was was sicker than i'd i'd ever been so baynard um you know you talk about in your piece about self-isolating and self-quarantining what was that experience like for you well, it was crazy. I wish we would have had a better plan. But that morning, as we were eating, my wife and I talked about, well, what would we do if one of us got sick? And just sort of vaguely had the discussion. And we decided what room someone would self-quarantine in, since that seemed to be the primary way that, that we were dealing with it here in Maryland was, was self-quarantine. And that very night was when I got sick. And so she was asleep on the couch. And I immediately just went and grabbed what I needed to grab uh, in order to get the get a, the room set up for me to to sleep in grab some sheets grab my toiletries wipe down the bathroom that we normally share uh got in there and called her on the cell phone i was like you need to wake up i'm sick and she got a couple things that she needed the problem is the room is and we're super lucky and privileged to have an extra room to be in at all um and and so i want to acknowledge that but uh i used it as a writing room and it's where she keeps her clothes so she was then stuck without a lot of clothes and toiletries for the next two weeks. Um, we were really lucky with it being a loft space that we live in that she could hear me. The, the number of times in the middle of the night that I was coughing and seriously got concerned for my, my well-being. I was so grateful that she could hear what was happening. Um, and she could stand on the stairwell and we could see each other at about a 30-foot uh, distance. Uh oh. It froze up. Stuff. There we go. <laughs> so sorry. So uh, yeah, for doing things like this, the sound in here is terrible. But it was great when I was locked in a room just to hear life. Uh, you know, it kept from feeling quite so isolated. Hey, hey, Baynard. Um, I saw you on your Facebook post. You were saying that you were the sickest you've ever been, but you still didn't warrant having to go in to get a test uh, for coronavirus. I'm wondering if you feel as if uh, that's the case for like a lot of people in Maryland and they're just simply not getting tested. So we don't know how prevalent the coronavirus is here. Also, on a side note, I really enjoyed your Nicole's post about making a mask out of her old running T-shirt. FYI. <laughs> they work well, too. We, that's the masks we're using. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel like we have no idea what's happening here or in the country at large. I mean, I if I knew for a fact that I had it or that she had it, was asymptomatic, then we would be able to be more helpful. Our, our building, the floor in our building here is we're organizing a mutual aid brigade. And, I, and because we have a lot of nurses on the floor and I'd feel a lot more comfortable being able to help, being able to give plasma, all sorts of things had I been able to get a test. But one of the things we don't think about is it's not just the shortage of tests, but the shortage of PPE, because for every patient, they have to use different set of gloves, different masks, different uh, shield and all of that stuff. And so what we're using for tests are all of the things that we're short of. And, and it does leave us flying completely blind as to what's happening. We have no idea the numbers of people who might be asymptomatic, of people who have had it. And, and my good friend, Kara Ober, who publishes Be More Art here, she, we were comparing symptoms uh, as we had been going along. I had been comparing symptoms to the number of people. And she finally, when she had to go to the hospital, finally got a test. And both of us had been told repeatedly, until you have to come in and be hospitalized, you're really not going to get warrant a test. And the best thing to do is to stay there. And at some level, I understand that. I don't want to use, if I'm going to survive, and, and fortunately I did, I don't want to use the stuff given the, the awful shortages that we have. I just never want to hear about how we have the greatest healthcare system in the world again. 
Bernard, I just wanted to um, lift up the point that you made about if you knew um, whether or not you had gotten it and had any kind of immunity, however temporary, that um, that would be a real organizational level up for um, for uh, mutual aid and delivery and volunteering uh, opportunities all over the place. Um, it seems to me that what is needed is a test, a home test, so that we don't have to worry so much about the PPE of the frontline caregivers um, that can tell you whether or not you have antibodies. So you know whether or not you have any kind of um, uh, immunity to it. Um, does that strike you as, uh, if there were such a thing, um, is that sort of what you would be looking for? Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about the potential of, of the antibody test because they can tell if it's ever been in your body, if your body has produced any antibodies to fight it. And so that's of great value because even the people who are asymptomatic that, that we wouldn't want to waste the test on given the few that we have, unlike uh, other countries with decent medical systems. But yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing. I would, because I could give plasma and that may be useful. There'd be a great number of things that I feel like I could be more of a help after this if we had any kind of knowledge. But as it is, we just have no knowledge whatsoever. Maynard also um, crowdsourced, which attempted to crowdsource me a thermometer last week because I was <laughs> sick. And I have not been able to find one for weeks. And I was like, I don't know if I have a fever. I don't know what I have. And he couldn't even find one. Like that's how kind of wild, wild west we are right now. And that we're just like, begging each other for thermometers and like Clorox wipes and gloves. So thanks, Using Bain. Using thermometers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was the ultimate suggestion was, was trying the meat thermometer. That's where we're yes. at. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't even want to, I don't even want to ask you, Lisa, where you put that meat thermometer. I put it in my mouth. <laughs> Just messing with you. And I hope you did put it in your mouth. That people are calling me for medical advice. That so far in my life, my only medical advice has been dealing with cannabis and and psychedelics, uh, and you know now like because we have such bad advice. Like after I started posting about it, numerous people have been uh, calling and texting me. And and late last night I got a call. I, I got a text this morning, and so it it that. Oops. <coughs> I think we're I think we're a, a tad bit frozen with Baynard. Is he if if he's gone, Baynard? We're we're sorry that we lost you guys. No, he's back. You should check out. Uh, is he back? You back, Baynard? Yep. You froze up for a I second. Can, yeah, I can hear you again at least. Yes. Fin finish up your point, hon. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, just that we're in a situation where people are turning to someone like me to ask medical questions is not a good place for us to be with this. Hey, I ask my weed man all kinds of questions, sir. Uh, <laughs> not a weed dealer, to be clear, just a weed reviewer. <laughs> if why not you, Baynard? Why not you? These are the that, that is my question for you today, sir. I mean, you know, I mean, for real. Like, I, I do have experience of having been sick, but that's usually not who we want to ask uh, about getting well. It's just how did you happen to get through this by sheer luck? Um, because that's all it was, was sheer luck and, mm -hmm. and the, the certain amount of privilege to, uh, be able to self-isolate and to stay at home and stuff. But, uh, we need to have, be getting more resources to our medical professionals who are on the front line, who are doing the best that they can and risking their lives every day. Uh, you know, and we're not giving them the resources to act with the knowledge that they could act with, that they have the training and the resources to use unlike people like me. Mm. All right. Well, Baynard, we appreciate you taking the time sharing your story with us. Uh, go to the WashingtonPost.com. In the Outlook section, you'll find Baynard's piece about COVID quarantine household plan. Folks, you need a plan. Check out Baynard's piece because he's got some great advice for you. Baynard, we appreciate you, you joining us today on Stir Crazy, sir. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I love the new show. Keep it up. Thanks a lot, y'all. Bye, Baynard. Bye, Baynard. Much love and grim solidarity to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> grim solidarity. What 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 a phrase. Now, listen, gang, if you're watching and you have some comments, questions, whatever, just drop it in the comments section below. Uh, our good guy, James, James over at the social media department, he's going to zip it on over to us and we'll check it out. But first, um, 
our own uh, Jacqueline Lukman, wonderful reporter here at The Real News, she did an interview with a, um, a doctor in New York who is treating patients uh, amid this coronavirus pandemic. He had some very sobering things to say. Dwayne, let's go to the video. Prior to the pandemic hitting, I can, I'll just use New York as an example. Nurses in New York were already advocating strongly that they needed improved staffing ratios in hospitals throughout New York City. Uh, I work in a hospital where staff, uh, the nurses who work in the emergency room sometimes care for 16 to 18 patients for every one nurse. And anybody who has an experience being in an emergency room can imagine what that would be like if one individual was being split between 16 or 18 patients. They were completely overworked, completely um, short-staffed, and they, it got to the point that one of the largest nursing union in the country was pushing to potentially strike in five hospitals in New York City, advocating for safer staffing ratios. At that time, Hospitals pushed back, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later, why, but they pushed back and they refused to give those staffing ratios. This was all prior to a pandemic hitting New York City or the United States and the rest of the world. So one can only imagine what an emergency room would look like or what a hospital would look like with a pandemic hitting the city. I work with other physicians who are working in emergency rooms, and they say that they're currently intubating or putting a tube down people's throat to help them breathe the same number of people in one day that they typically do in an entire week in a normal, in a normal setting. They're typically seeing the same number of people die in one day that they typically do in an entire month. And that's right now. And I think that as we're going to see more and more of this virus spreading, partly because they, the United States did not have a proactive response to the viral outbreak whatsoever. The country had a several month head start to prepare. And instead of upscaling mass production of masks, ventilators, supplies that would be needed, recruiting staff, those types of things, they, many hospitals, it's now being documented, opted for something called just-in-time production, which would basically be something where they wouldn't have to buy supplies in advance. Instead, they could wait to see if the pandemic actually hit or not, because buying supplies in advance would be an extra cost for hospitals if the pandemic, if the pandemic never hit. That was Dr. Mike Pappas speaking to The Real News' Jacqueline Lukman. Um, Jesse, when you hear a doctor talk about how prior to the pandemic, hospitals were already short-staffed, that hospital administrators didn't want to spend the extra money to buy supplies, PPE, for its nurses and doctors at the risk that the pandemic didn't hit and they didn't want to incur the extra costs. I mean, I, I salute our medical and our healthcare workers, but as far as our healthcare system, we are the shithole country here, are we not? No question about it, no question about it. Uh, not only haven't they made the investments in the kinds of equipment that uh, we need, in fact, they're still cutting budgets right now. I mean, when I was, um, the, that strike, the proposed strike that he was talking about, I was at the nurses union at that point, um, organizing these nurses. I can say that I was working at the public hospitals. That proposed strike was at the private hospitals, um, which are much more well-financed. But I can say that collecting bargaining surveys from the nurses on what their top issues were, safe staffing was the number one issue every single time. And number two, most of the time was uh, equipment especially in the public hospitals, Bellevue, Elmhurst, they were using old antiquated equipment um, that really, really desperately needed upgrading. Uh, and they were finding that, you know, nurses had to spend so much more time doing paperwork than actually caring for uh, the patients. Um, so yes, any system that really like um, has healthcare decisions and public health decisions being driven by um, these kind of budgetary decisions. And of course, um, the, uh, um, corporations that pro that uh, manufacture and provide uh, the equipment and these other and medicines and things like that, the pharmaceutical industry um, and the insurance industry uh, needing to make profits is a system that is necessarily going to subordinate 
the um, needs of patients when they get sick. Um, and right now, even in New York, as this pandemic is happening, we see uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor, who is widely being hailed um, in the country as a, a superior surrogate for Joe Biden, who appears not to really even be running for president very much. Um, we see him cutting back Medicaid funding in New York in the midst of a pandemic. So the public hospitals, not only was it about they weren't ready to make the necessary um, investment in their staffing and equipment, um, they were facing, uh, you know, the health and hospitals, which is the, the public corporation of, of um, public hospitals in New York, is facing a, a multi-billion dollar structural deficit and figuring out how to cut things. It's a completely backward system, um, and it obviously shows the prioritization of the wealth and the acquisition possibilities for an elite few over uh, the livelihoods of the great you know, uh, Lisa, it really uh, makes me want to. And it, it's got to be done away with. Strangle people. Sorry, gang. <laughs> I, I think I heard it was, it was dragging a little bit in my ear. But Lisa, I wanted to say because, you know, when you hear stuff like that, that, that st uh, hospitals were closed, um, public funding for, for health care was slashed in advance of the pandemic, because it, it, it doesn't seem like this is a matter that we can't address this in a competent way, it's more so that we won't. Right. I don't know what else to say. Like you just summed it up. The depth to which people will sink for greed is just like the saddest part of this. Well, the, the deaths are the saddest part, but that we're just sitting there watching them and letting them happen um, for some extra money is just insane. And if we get to the point of the, of the show where we're talking about Andrew Cuomo, um, let me know because I we can also bring Larry Hogan into that for like governors and leaders that are getting undue praise because I got a whole bunch of stuff to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go in, honey. The floor <laughs> is yours. You want to go in on Larry Hogan? Get in his hind parts, madam. Go well, on. Like, I just feel like people want good news stories, and which is understandable because this is an absolutely horrific thing to live through. But let's not make any elected official, you know, the, you know, Santa Claus right now. All of these people are literally what keeps us between life and death. And as Jesse mentioned, uh, Cuomo's no angel. Larry Hogan, there was just some piece in the Washington Post this weekend about how he's this, he's going toe to toe for Trump and has literally never even said his name. Um, yeah. He's not our, you know, he's not our, our Corona daddy. So like everybody <laughs> needs journalists, you know, I'm not, my, my, my beef, especially is with journalists and writers and like our job right now is to hold these politicians feet to the fire to keep as many people safe as possible. That's all I got to say. Leandro. Um, I mean, both Jesse and Lisa kind of, I've summed it up perfectly in a sense. Um, I mean, I think the only reason they're praising these governors for anything is because our president is so fucking terrible uh, during his personal briefing. So anything that's different or hope inducing is better than that. And Cuomo's, you know, he's terrible, but like his press briefings are much better than the federal and national press briefings. So people are looking for hope, which I think uh, is what Lisa was implying. Um, just a little bit on nurses and doctors. Um, I'm grateful that they're they're great at social media and they can get the story out because um, what they're talking about in terms of no PPE and how terrible uh, ICUs have been um, have been the most compelling stories that have come out of this. Where you can make a convincing argument that you know you have to put aside um, kind of the capitalist drive for running hospitals and you know administrators don't seem like they're in crisis mode at this point um they seem like they're still trying to tow like standard operating procedures whereas you know doctors and nurses are in triage um they're not even allowed to provide their own personal equipment even if there's a shortage of equipment from hospitals which seems terrifying and i know it's not necessarily policy but like we're in a place where you've never seen anything like this happen before and it's tantamount that we keep our healthcare professionals safe because if we lose them, then we lose everyone. Indeed, and we gotta send a shout out to Sam in the YouTube comments. Sam says that this is the most expensive third world country. Sam, 
that needs to be on a t-shirt. Listen, we're gonna take a quick break right here because we are in the middle of our fundraising drive. And if you like the kind of content and the kind of stories that we provide here on The Real News, please consider dropping your homies a couple of coins. Let's go to the, to the fundraising pitch. Hello, my name is Taya Graham, and this is Stephen Janis, and we're the hosts of the Police Accountability Report. <laughs> we're trying to do a $50,000 fundraiser right now, and each dollar will be matched. Now more than ever, we need independent journalism that's not funded by corporate backers. We need people that can give us the truth and the unvarnished truth. So we really need you to help and donate. And please remember, any donation, how small, it will be matched, and trust me, it will be appreciated. Thank you so much for your support, and be safe out there. Thank you so much to Steven and Taya. They host the Police Accountability Report right here on The Real News, so be sure to check that out. Uh, they, they bring amazing stories to the audience and are definitely holding the police accountable, so definitely uh, give them a look. So moving on along in our slate, you guys, today uh, Wisconsin is holding their primary in the middle of a pandemic. Go fucking figure. So what happened was the primary was always scheduled for today, at the last minute, the governor decided to postpone the primary and extend the deadline for mail-in ballots. The Wisconsin GOP said, oh, no, no, no. Them people gonna get out there and vote today. Vote or die, is what the Wisconsin GOP said. So they took uh, a challenge to the state Supreme Court, which said that the deadline for mail-in ballots could be extended then that decision was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which in a five to four decision, straight party line vote, uh, the conservative justices prevailed and said that, no, y'all got to go out there and vote today in line, uh, which was stunning. And Joe Biden said, well, yeah, you got to vote. You got to vote. In the midst of pandemic, it's a pandemic. Put on a mask. Wash your hands. It's not a big deal. Uh, Leandro, I can't believe that elected leaders, even our, our, our highest justices, have made this decision, putting people's lives literally at risk in order to go vote in a primary. What are your thoughts? I mean, RBG's dissenting opinion was pretty scathing about this. And essentially what you said, you know, either, you know, your right to vote now depends on you know, re your right to life at this point. Um, What's even worse is I saw an article today, like in Milwaukee, there were supposed to be 120 polling stations or voting stations open and only five opened. So when you saw the pictures of people lining up around the block, it was crazy. I mean, this is literally life and death. And, you know, I'm glad people are exercising their right to vote, but I, I can't imagine making this kind of choice. Lisa, can you imagine right now? I mean, we there there's elections upcoming, and I'm not exactly sure how we are going to handle them. But for God's sakes, it, while uh, while the virus is accelerating across the country and people are dying in record numbers, you're going to compel people to go out and vote, especially when it's older people who are more likely to vote. Give give us some thoughts here. My thoughts is that like, well, two thoughts. I saw someone on Twitter point out that black people been, you know, risking our lives to vote. So now I guess everybody's welcome to that party. Um, and also like the GOP has no bottom. And I feel like Democrats are either kind of doing what Joe Biden says, which is kind of like catering to it or just kind of waiting for them to become nice people. And so we have no opposition party and that's, concerning to say the least. I don't know. I mean, Jesse, for God's sake, who is the voice of reason in all of this? Who Who is saying, uh, I mean, Donald Trump wants people to go vote. Joe Biden wants people to go vote. And there, I, I, I don't know, as Lisa said, who, who is the opposition? Who is in favor of sanity in these chaotic times? Well, I mean, I guess it's incumbent upon me to point out that Joe Biden is not unopposed in his primary race to be the presidential candidate. Actually, there is somebody out there who has been calling for exactly the kinds of changes that we need. Um, but because the mainstream media is intent on ignoring the candidacy of Bernie Sanders um, and was even before coronavirus, except that they couldn't quite ignore him before because he was breaking 
fundraising records and holding mass rallies and having these um, unprecedented uh, door knocking drives. Uh, now that he's tactically limited and can't do any of those things, um, obviously they're they're completely ready to ignore him. But I should say that um, Governor Evers uh, didn't initiate that call. In fact, um, the chair of the Democratic Party in, in Wisconsin, Ben Wickler, um, the Sanders campaign, lots and lots of Democrats all over the state and all over the country were calling for Wisconsin to do what Ohio did and postpone the election by several months and um, initiate a robust vote by mail um, uh, operation um, and calling on the governor to do what Governor DeWine, a Republican, did in Ohio and postponed the election. And he was out there saying, I don't have the power to do that. It's actually in the legislature. And the courts also ruled it's got to be the legislature that does it. Um, and so for it, it, it took something to get Evers to make that decision. I'm glad that he did. And actually, I think it was smart of him to wait until the day before to like um, limit the amount of time that the Republicans in the legislature would have to bring a suit. Unfortunately, it wasn't last minute enough and they were able to um, get the court to rule in their favor. Um, but there was like, the, actually, Joe Biden is in the minority among the Democrats uh, in not calling for this uh, election to be postponed. It's really craven uh, and crass on on the part of his uh, campaign. And um, I can't see how that uh, will increase Democratic enthusiasm for his candidacy, um, which is already a field that he trails in and is a worrying sign for November. Gang, let me get your take because I, I feel as if, you know, Jesse brings up Bernie Sanders. And as he said, is right, Bernie Sanders was calling for a delay in the primaries or postponement to the primaries, even calling on his supporters not to go to the polls because, duh, it'd be risking their lives. And Bernie is the only candidate anywhere who is advocating uh, for Medicare for all, which would be ideal given the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But my perception from the mainstream media, it's almost like like they pat Bernie on the head, like, Bernie, you're making too much sense. We don't want to hear from you right now. Bernie, go away with all your common sense solutions that are likely uh, that could be effective uh, given the, the kind of crises that we're facing. I mean, Leandro, I feel like Bernie Sanders is being put in a corner right now, despite making the most sense out of the politicians that we see speaking out and showing leadership on this. I mean, he's been in a corner, right? Like uh, this has been essentially kind of over for two months in, in terms of what the Democrats are seeing. And, and, and while his policies um, make the most sense right now, but uh, the thing I'm afraid of is like, if we had Medicare for all, I think our system would collapse at this point. You know, like if we switch that over, um, we're just not simply, we're finding out we're simply not equipped to provide that kind of health care in, in this country, which is damning. Um, just to build on top of Jesse's point about uh, the Wisconsin election, what's even more crazy is what the district court, I think, overturned like, um, was just to extend absentee balloting for six days until the 13th. And even that was denied. Um, by the Supreme Court, um, which seems like the most reasonable answer in terms of how things were going to get down in Wisconsin. Moving the primary date to June was kind of dead in the water, but to not even extend absentee balloting was just, it's insane and crazy. Um, well, you know, I, I'm thinking about obviously the elections that are coming up, how we're going to deal with that. And obviously people, their voter, their votes are being suppressed, literally, because if you opt not to go to the polls out of self-preservation, completely understandable, your your options are limited, if any, uh, that you are able to, to cast a ballot in this situation. But that's just one part of this, um, you know, sort of hydra of an issue that we have with coronavirus has got so many heads, it's hard to pick just one. And we know when we go into the stores, it's hard to find basic supplies. Lisa said she was trying to find thermometers. They were none to be found. I've been scouring the streets for toilet paper and the internet for toilet paper. Good luck finding that uh, right now. But one scenario that we haven't fully explored is what happens if over two and a half million farm workers in this country take sick with coronavirus and are unable to work, therefore disrupting the food supply. If you think it's bad now, because people can't get their hands on Lysol wipes, 
Imagine what will happen if bread and milk go scarce. Leandro, the New York Times wrote a piece about this. What, what, what was your take? Um, so yeah, I've talked to a, a couple of friends of mine. One runs a restaurant and one is uh, essentially a professional butcher. And they, they're they saying the food supply is being affected now. Um, they're seeing, you know, kind of declines in supply, kind of longer delivery times and they're estimating it in a bunch in, you know, in a two or three week span, it's probably going to get much worse. And I think our food supply is in huge danger. And, and one of my friends made a good point is the minute one is one expector gets the coronavirus is that's going to start the end of the food supply when, when the FDA can no longer inspect the food and it's not necessarily, you know, the workers, if they get it, but once inspectors stop, start getting the coronavirus, then, you know, the food supply will be in grave danger at that point. Um, you know, it's unfortunate because uh, people who do work on farms and who 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 do supply food for us are probably the most vulnerable to the coronavirus. They're uh, in large part, a lot of them are undocumented. A lot of them don't won't get any parts of the stimulus and a lot of them need these jobs to just kind of subsist. So uh, I think it's a huge concern in terms of uh, the way our food supply has been structured. And I don't think, I think it's coming down the pike, you know, within the next month or so that everything will become much more scarce. You know, I think when when food starts becoming scarce, that's when the social contract goes out the window and we are so fucked. Lisa Snowden McRae, what, what do you have to say? It just I mean, people are buying like, more guns too. Yeah, well, yikes. It just feels like every one of our chickens is coming home to roost in this particular coronavirus. Like Miss Rona brought everything. She bought the receipts for the way we've been treating our low wage workers, the way we've been treating our immigrants, the way we've been treating black people. And like, we're at this moment now where we have to, we're forced into action. So I don't know what's going to happen. And I had not even considered that our food supply would not be what it is right now, but that, you know, now I have another thing to uh, think about when I'm up at two in the morning, staring at my ceiling. So thanks, well, Kim. That, oh, sorry about that, Monty. I didn't mean I didn't mean to pee on your back there, uh, Lisa. <laughs> I mean, but guys, no, it's 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 some serious shit because, for example, on the West Coast, we have over four hundred thousand uh, of our farm workers who are undocumented. Um, they they don't have access to to health care, regular health care. Um, obviously, they are dealing with uh, issues of being undocumented, obviously with Trump ramping up immigration control in that sense, that's another layer um, of reluctance Kim, maybe to go in. Yes, dear. That's what I want to, it just popped into my head. Like, well, we don't need those guys, right? Because Trump said that they were all bad and they need to go back to where they came from. I, I thought we would be fine. Well, well and, you don't need them until and, it's dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the dirty little secret is because of Trump's immigration policies, um, farm workers were already uh, um, uh, farms were already having more difficulty staffing up their their uh, their farms. You know, that's incredibly intensive labor for a class of people who are routinely described as lazy and just coming here to collect welfare checks and to, mm -hmm. to live high off the hog. So that was already happening. It's only more intense now. And it's not just the food supply that's going to. Um, spark uh, this real disintegration in the social contract, because I saw that the, the Federal Reserve of St. Louis is now estimating that 47 million people are going to get laid off in this process, which is in addition to the, I, I guess, three or four million who already are unemployed, meaning that um, we're going to be at 32 percent unemployment, which is six percentage points higher than the peak of the Great Depression. Now, in normal times, if this were a crash that were precipitated by a, a financial crisis on Wall Street, we would be in a much better position right now to essentially shock doctrine it from the left uh, because of the, um, the movement infrastructure that has been built up over the last decade from Occupy Wall Street, the movement for black lives, the climate justice movement, the Bernie Sanders campaigns. But because it's because of coronavirus and not some Wall Street um, chicanery, we're tactically limited. We can't even riot. 
you know, if the, if if 10 million people file for unemployment in two weeks in normal times, there would be riots. But we can't even do that right now. We can't assemble. We can't occupy state capitals. We can't even go door knocking. We can't even get our blocks together because we're all self isolated. So it's this incredible moment that would be an incredible moment for us to really step into it with real courage and integrity and put forward some really transformative solutions for our society. And we're all locked up at home. It's the most frustrating thing in the world for an organizer. And, and I can and I want to expound on that a bit, Jesse, because, you know, there's a lot of discussions um, about, you know, rent strikes, rent freezes, a general labor strike. What do any of these things look like in self-isolation and in social distancing? Because these are movements that really require bodies, do they not? I don't I, you tell me. I don't know if it has the same impact digitally. I know it definitely has uh, effect. But when you see hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of people assembled in one place, it sends such a power signal that I'm not sure translates the same well, the same way either online or on social media. No doubt. Yeah, very difficult to telegraph your your the um, numbers and the unity and the um, the intensity of feeling of your participants in this moment. I will say that a rent strike doesn't require public action. It just requires that you not pay. And actually, I think we're going to have some kind of forced rent strike, especially come next month, because the people who can't pay won't pay. And so uh, they're, they're, I don't know what their game plan is for dealing with that, because there are a lot of landlords who just simply are not going to get their rental value. And that's what they've pledged to the banks in interest for the mortgages that they got in order to then flip the property later for the, the land value gain. So it's just a chain reaction. And there has to be some kind of um, rent relief forthcoming because there's a forced rent strike. It doesn't even have to be organized. If it to, to achieve the optimal like political changes, it should be organized and there should at least be some kind of hashtag or like large scale digital effort to coalesce people who can't pay within a, a, a given um, movement container. But um, even without that, there are going to be millions of people who just can't pay their rent. And so they're not going to pay. And so it's going to be an effective rent strike um, rather than an organized one. Indeed. Guys, I'm sorry. My brain just went to like the worst case scenario. I'm thinking like if the food just if the food chain gets disrupted, like what are the three things that I want like in my house? And all I can think of is like a Brita pitcher, a pistol. <laughs> and, and I can't even think of something to eat. I don't even know what food I want. I just know I need water and bullets. I don't I don't know what else. What, what would you guys have in your house if you can't go to the grocery store? I mean, I live in an apartment, but maybe I need wow. to get like a chicken. I don't know. Eat like a chicken? Yeah, like a chicken. It, it could lay eggs. I don't know. A lot of people have had that thought. A lot of people have had that thought. And actually, chickens are, chicks are sold out because people have had that thought. It's very difficult oh to get livestock. <laughs> we're, we're, um, my partner and I, who I'm um, uh, sheltering in place with, we're going to plant some herbs on it because we have rooftop access, but I don't know how much sustenance herbs are going to be able to provide for how long. We might wind up eating each other's fingers or something. It's hard <laughs> to tell. I mean, be sure to plant parsley and cilantro. They're very, very nutritious. I mean, flour and salt and water are still plentiful, but it's hard to find yeast these days. But I taught myself how to make bread um, in anticipation, but... That's about it. We can pick up bread from Leandro's house every day. Yes. Until Leandro's until I run out of yeast. <laughs> Apparently there's a there's a run on yeast too. But you can make your own starter. And I was gonna say, isn't that like a naturally occurring thing? Yeast? yeast? Oh yeah, you can make your own, but yeah. I make homemade wine with yeast. There you go. I can yeah. tell y'all I can tell y'all how to make wine. I like I'll trade you food. I'll trade you bread for wine. <laughs> I, we might can do that actually. I have I have a, a vat of like blueberry wine and uh, peach wine that I made last year. That's just stand. It's very strong though. That as wow. as my as my family in the country say. Shout out to my uncle Tommy. He says it'll make you drammy. <laughs> <laughs> and and don't don't go biting off Uncle Tommy. Drammy. That's from Charles City, Virginia. Listen, gang. <laughs> uh, that 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 wraps up our news portion of stir crazy. Let's get to some fun stuff, Dwayne. I want to see what John Krasinski uh, was doing with his little cute self, having fun on the, on the interwebs. Jim. Since Lemon Miranda kind of was in it on one Broadway, 
It was kind of the same. He is in it. Um, I mean, he's not like the best part of it, obviously. Clearly, I'm the best part of it. Yeah, Lynn is not a good part in the movie. He yeah. is a okay part. He's kind of like a backup dancer. He's kind of like a backup dancer, I would yeah, say. He's yeah, he's kind of like a like a b-boy or I something. mean, I forget that he's even in Hello? Oh, wow. Hold on a second. I was wow. in my poppin' Wait, we want Miranda? He just joined. Oh, oh wait. <sighs> Hi. Hey, Lynn, I didn't know you could Zoom bomb, man. That's a yeah, little Lynn, weird. This is a Zoom bomb. She's here to see Mary Poppins, not Jack the Lamplighter. Yeah, okay? exactly. Hi, Aubrey. How are you? Uh, I'm Good. so sorry you didn't get to see Hamilton. I'm so glad to meet you. Speechless. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hi. Oh, um, man, Lynn, thank you so much for stopping by, but uh, we, we pretty much got it handled now. We, thanks, I just, Lynn. We're good. We did a really classy thing. We sent her tickets. Oh, are you a big center. office man? Nope, she's no, not really at all. I'm a big Actually, fan of the memes of it, though. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, Lynn. That was a source like of the... <laughs> <laughs> But we, um, we're sending her to New York, Lynn, and we're going to send her to Hamilton in New York. Well, that's amazing. Um, I, I think we can top that right now, though. Oh, wait, something. Oh, wait, oh, wait. Sorry. There are a bunch of people wow. just joining. That's my favorite song from Hamilton. How does a bastard? Orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman Dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean By providence impoverished and squalor Grow up to be a hero and a scholar A ten dollar Well, wasn't that nice? <laughs> um, so that was John Krasinski with uh, Hamilton's Lin-Manuel Miranda um, surprising a young lady who was unable to go see Hamilton live because of Broadway being shut down because we are in a pandemic. You know, you know, I don't want to sound like a hater, but I might sound like a hater. I've never been a fan of this whole Hamilton thing. And the fact that it was like a phenom, like really bothered me because I'm like, wait a minute. So the premise of the musical is non-white people pretend to be the slave owners. Is, is that pretty much it? I don't like the rapping. <laughs> I mean, but is that the premise of it? Like, well, no, I never saw it. Okay. Yeah, actually, I've never seen it, but I thought that clip was cute. It was cute. I'm yeah. a big fan of The Office. I, Leandro actually yeah, sent me that um, too. Sent me that. I think it was that one um, this morning because he knows. I, like, I don't think a day of this lockdown has gone by that I haven't binge watched like at least five episodes of The Office. This is kind of like blandly comforting. <laughs> Jesse, have you seen I Hamilton? I, I have seen Hamilton uh, and um, I had some issues with it, but my issues were like really nerdy because I have a background in theater and I study <laughs> finance and they didn't correctly like um, show how Hamilton was really dispositive when it came to establishing the treasury and all that kind of stuff. And I think Lemon Miranda Miranda's pretty corny. Well, that is that. Well, guys... Uh, you have successfully wasted about an hour <laughs> with us going stir crazy here on The Real News. I got to send thanks uh, to Jesse, Leandro, and Lisa, our panel. Um, thank you guys for stopping by and getting crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. It was fun. Yeah. It was great. All right. All right, gang. Um, I'm Kim Brown. I'm your host. Come tune in tomorrow for episode nine, Stir Crazy. It's the real news. <laughs>